Prices keep rising in America, and policymakers are asking how the central bank could let this happen. Forward guidance, I think, overall slowed the response of the Fed to the um, inflation problem last year. Investors think more price increases are coming. By the Fed's count of inflation expectations, prices will have risen an additional 6.8% by the summer of 2023. It turns out that the Federal Reserve might hold some of the blame. It is going to be very challenging. It has been made significantly more challenging by the events of the last few months. We need to make sure that the central bank is on the side of everybody in the country. The big concern is that not only will we have these big increases in inflation this year, but that will lead people to expect higher increases in the future. Because if that's the case, it sort of compounds upon itself. We could be headed to stagflation. It might get better, but it might get a whole lot worse. And if it gets a whole lot worse, uh, brace yourself for uncertainty. How did the U.S. government misread inflation? And what does this mean for people in the United States? The Federal Reserve is America's central bank. The job of the Federal Reserve is to safeguard the buying power of the dollar and to make interest rate policy in the public interest. They're supposed to minimize inflation, maximize employment. It does this by working with retail banks that Americans use. Think Chase, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, etc. Banks have an account at the Fed the way you have an account at a bank, and the Fed takes that money and invests it in treasury bills, mortgage-backed securities, and pays the bank a little bit of interest. The Fed manages the U.S. money supply. Their decisions can have a large economic impact, but some believe that Congress's actions within the economy are much more important. The Federal Reserve needs to be reformed. The Federal Reserve needs individuals who are on the receiving end of monetary policy, not, not individuals who are only PhDs in economics who've never held a job in the real world and have a pension for life and are not affected by zero interest rate policy making life more difficult for, for savers who don't have a public pension for life. The Fed's job is complicated. It involves making predictions about the future. Things like how much will inflation be a year from today? And if it's up, what should we do about that? Experts believe the U.S. Central Bank has made important decisions that drove better outcomes throughout history. Supporters point to the Fed's strong provisions of credit during the 2020 recession. This cash ultimately kept millions of people afloat as the world locked down. Also, the bank achieved a balance of low inflation, cheap lending rates, and low unemployment for the better part of three decades. This stability minimized price increases while supporting the creation of many jobs but occasionally mistakes are made. The forward guidance, I think overall, on the margin, uh, slowed the response of the Fed to the um, inflation problem last year, to, to, to some extent. So does that uh, mean it was a mistake? I think in retrospect, yes, it was a mistake, and I think they agree it was a mistake. So here are the three big mistakes. The first was a sharp increase in the money supply. In recent years, the overall pot of cash in the Fed's control has grown sharply. Changes in the money supply can take months or even years to materialize within the economy. If the same amount of goods existed in the economy, but there was twice as much money, then we would think that the price of everything would double. This sharp increase initially showed up in the savings accounts of regular Americans before they quickly vanished. Well, from everything that we've seen, that money is concentrated in the hands of the oldest and the wealthiest Americans. What has stuck around is a fierce upward spiral in prices for goods. As this dynamic took hold, the Fed kept adding dollars to the money supply, primarily by printing and issuing bonds that some say the market didn't need. The result was the sharpest bout of inflation observed in more than four decades in the States. Similar dynamics unfolded around the world, bringing forth a historic new inflationary era. Very few households, if you will, ever got to enjoy the benefits of zero interest rate policy. Only your biggest borrowers. Now on to mistake number two. When it started to raise interest rates, the bank was doing so at way too slow of a pace. The central bank uses its federal funds interest rate to counteract this high level of inflation. Their models suggest that if this interest rate goes up, that'll make inflation go down. That's exactly what they're trying to do now. The central bank waited until March 2022 to flip the switch and make lending more expensive. They started with quarter percentage rate hikes and have since made bigger hikes. 
This fast pace of liftoff is a start of a sharp reversal from the past three decades of policy. So the Federal Reserve maintaining record low interest rates for a long period of time sort of led to some of the largest asset bubbles that we ever saw. And people who had money sort of going into the crisis and was a were able to deploy that capital into the stock market, into the housing market, have done extraordinarily well as a result of the Fed's policies. The final mistake here was that the Fed waited too long to act at all. Early signs of inflation took hold for months before the Fed took action. For example, fuel was up more than 50% in November of 2021. Even prices for used cars were up over 30% year over year in the same time frame. This was happening as the Fed kept its interest rates near zero and kept buying massive amounts of bonds. At the time, the bank called inflation transitory, transitory hoping it would pass. So far, it hasn't. Mr. Powell indicated himself, um, both of us probably could have used a better term than transitory. But the Federal Reserve wasn't the only group that made mistakes during this time. Economists believe that the federal government played a very large role in this inflationary spiral too. Fiscal policy is made by the Congress and the president, and that involves taxation and spending. And that's different from monetary policy because it really affects the amount of money that is going to be in your pocket, whereas monetary policy works through the banking system. So some of the record fiscal stimulus that we saw coming out of the COVID recession were expanded unemployment insurance checks, the general checks, the enhanced child tax credit. All of those were examples of fiscal policy to try to get the economy recovered as quickly as possible. Economists like the famous Milton Friedman believe that inflation comes from changes in the money supply. Most of the episodes Milton Friedman looked at were times when governments, which were in, in deep problems, printed money and handed it out. So if you remember nothing from this, remember one thing. If you print money and hand it out, drop it from helicopters, as Friedman said, you will get inflation. The current Federal Reserve Board keeps track of this supply in a publicly available data set. See the sharp uptick in 2020? This money went directly into the hands of actual people who spent it, saved it, or invested the funds. That creates a fierce rush of demand. And at the time, it was outpacing supply of the goods available, possibly creating inflation. A lot of that money went into emergency COVID bills like the American Rescue Plan. The government was able to spend cash it didn't have because it got huge loans from the Fed. They're printing money to spend it, printing money to hand it out, printing money to make transfer payments. That's exactly what our government did in the last two years of pandemic. It's, t it's technically not printing money, but it's it, from an economic point of view, the same as printing it money and, and, and handing it out and it causes inflation. So that is, that is both monetary and fiscal policy. And the next time there's a handout, don't be so easy to take it. Just bear in mind what got us here. And that was overly intrusive and aggressive fiscal policy that was monetized by the Federal Reserve. Outside of its own missteps, the government's fight with inflation was accelerated by various things outside of their control. Economists call these events black swans. In the 2020s, these so far have included COVID, supply chain disruptions, full-scale invasion by Russia into Ukraine, but when the U.S. government needs someone to respond to these events, they turn to their Federal Reserve. And whatever the Fed decides to do will then reverberate worldwide. That's because many businesses settle transactions with U.S. dollars, which the Fed controls. So there is a massive transmission mechanism that transmits U.S. monetary policy to the rest of the world. 80 some odd percent of all transactions in the world are done using the U.S. dollar. And Fed policy influences and dictates where the U.S. dollar is. So whatever we do is not contained within the United States economy. It affects the global economy. Dealing with these unexpected shocks is quite difficult as the Fed wades through other unknowns. As inflation took hold, some voting seats at the Fed stayed open. And making matters worse, a key member was forced to resign in what some believe was an insider trading scandal. Other voting members like Michelle Bowman warned of the danger of excess inflation, but went unheard in the committee chambers. The Federal Reserve Board is a massive organization full of staff that who need to know who's my leader going to be. And Randy Quarles said publicly, had there not been that level of internal uncertainty and strife, that the Fed would have been raising rates last year when it knew policy had become problematic, especially as it pertains to the housing market, 
which is the only form of inflation right now that is in the Fed's control, and it looks like they're trying very hard to break. Given that's the situation, it seems like the Fed's decision to continue to prop up the market was misguided because that sort of added fuel to the inflationary fire that we're currently dealing with. Economists believe that the Fed now has less ability to get things back on track without sparking a recession. It's still possible, though. To do that, they'll need to rapidly increase lending rates to what economists call a neutral interest rate, one where the economy is neither growing or shrinking too quickly. The neutral rate is a real interest rate. It doesn't matter if the neutral rate is 3%. That means something very different if inflation is 8% versus if inflation is 2%. If inflation is going to be high and remain higher, that means that the neutral rate in the economy is also going to be higher. Because the price of goods are going up, we need a higher return to stabilize the economy. If we were actually measuring inflation in a consistent manner, the peaks in the 70s and 80s are actually much more similar to the peak today than we would have initially thought. Still, the stories of the past could be relevant material for today's class of central bankers. While their mistakes are far and few between, they can have a profound impact. And for the record, their good calls can make a big impact too. If they hold steady and are committed to breaking inflation, as was the case with Paul Volcker, then we'll get to the end of this situation of pain quicker than if they were to try and draw out, postpone, delay the inevitable. So I think at this point, the Fed has to stick to its guns, even if that means taking speculators down. And that really is what has scared the Fed in the past. The Federal Reserve is supposed to make monetary policy in the whole of the public's interest, not just that of investors. And this is going to be a test of which they have not really had to take since 1981.